First up in this new series of The Gadget Show, how to become a pop star without leaving your bedroom, the cheapest and easiest way to print digital photos, and Susie puts night vision goggles to the ultimate test. This album is always outnumbered, never outgunned by the mighty prodigy, and it was made on a laptop computer. In fact, frontman Liam says most of it was done while still in bed. This is Destroy Rock and Roll by Milo, described by the NME as the savior of dance music. It was made on an Apple computer by a 24-year-old who lives on the Isle of Skye. Technology has made it easy to make good music, and tonight we'll show you how to record a single and then release it to the world, all from the comfort of your home computer. It's The Gadget Show's three easy steps to laptop pop. Step one is to go shopping, but here's our first piece of advice. Walk past the guitars, even the Ultimate 9 Grand Limited Edition. Laptop pop requires no instruments, and nor does it require any musical ability which is probably for the best. All you need is a recording studio, and shopping for one is easy. The constituent parts of a recording studio are essentially the same. You need speakers, a keyboard, a mixer, and a computer to power it all. This professional studio setup will set you back around £20,000. This semi-pro system about £10,000. This fairly decent Mac-based setup, about the £5,000 mark. But for our bedroom studio project, we're going to spend a fraction of that. Any decent computer can be turned into a mixing desk with the right software. A program like Mbox is aimed at the serious user. Cubase is popular but difficult to master. We've chosen Reason because it's what the Prodigy and Milo used and it came free with this handy gadget, a MIDI keyboard. You can expect to spend between 20 and 2,000 pounds on a MIDI compatible keyboard. This is a relatively straightforward one. I'll be using it to input my melodies and bass lines. You don't need to be able to play the keyboard, just use something to plonk the notes in. It's even got USB. Join us later to see if £350 worth of gear and no musical talent can make a song that gets into the charts. Night vision goggles have been used in every major conflict since World War II. They were once highly classified military technology, but now hunters, bird watchers, and anyone interested in playing soldiers can buy them on the high street. With the eerie green glow regularly beamed into our living rooms, it's no surprise that there's been a recent surge in private sales. But we want to know if these so-called image intensifiers that are available to the general public are any good. So, I've got three to test. These two are first generation, £99 and £500. And then this one is second generation technology at a cool £2,300. And they all work on the same principle of amplifying available light. Night vision devices turn light particles into electrons, which are amplified as they travel along a vacuum tube. When the electrons hit a phosphorus screen at the end, an image is emitted into the eyepiece. The green tint is useful in two ways. The human eye can distinguish between more shades of green than any other colour, so you see more detail. It's also a colour that keeps your pupils dilated, so when you take the device away, it's easier to adjust to the complete darkness. Because the optics inside the night vision goggles are so sensitive, if you use them in the daylight, then you'll just fry the insides. So this is going to have to be a night mission. And for our ultimate test, we have employed the ultimate professionals. Oh, yeah.
We're hitching a ride with the RAF's A-18 squadron, home of the Boeing CH-47, the Chinook. It's flown by the most highly trained pilots in the world, and when the darkness falls, night vision goggles are worn by both pilots and every member of the crew. Their third generation technology costing £25,000, and I had a quick go to set the benchmark. And my God, it, it looks like I'm looking in daylight. That's how good they are. Without them, it's pitch black. With them, you can see clearly from the back of one Chinook to the other. So, how will the high street stuff compare? Okay, these are the 99 pounds of binoculars, so we'll try these first. So, if I look through, focus. This is similar to the starlight scopes the Americans used in Vietnam, so you're relying on technology that's 40 years old. Fine for a bit of novelty value, but not much else. OK, these are the 500 pounds ones, and they have a magnification of six times. Already, they are a lot easier to use than the monocular versions that were 100 quid. Slightly clearer picture. If I look at the Chinook that's following us, I can make the outline out quite clear. And I can just about make out the helicopter blades going around. So the naked eye, I can only see the lights. These are definitely better than the monocular night vision goggles. So I'm not quite sure that they're 400 pounds better though. This was the image that's closest to what the pros see. You get a nice wide view and a much brighter image. There's no magnification, so depth perception is good, making them ideal for strapping to your head and walking around with. They may cost more than two grand, but they're undoubtedly the best. When it comes to night vision goggles, you definitely get what you pay for. We're showing you three easy steps to record a single and release it into the charts. Step one was buying the kit. Step two is where we make sweet, sweet music. The focus of our music making software is this timeline, the blank canvas where we drop beats and melodies. Above it, there's a rack of virtual components that create various noises. It's just like what you get in a well-equipped studio, right down to the wobbling cables. Now, this isn't the kind of programme that you're going to get to know in an afternoon. I've been playing with it for weeks and I still haven't found out most of its nooks and crannies. But it is pretty straightforward to get started and that usually means laying down a drum beat. This thing's loaded with all kinds of different drum kits. You've got dub, electronic. I'm going to go for house. I'll choose the first one. I'll hit preview. Yep, yeah, sounds pretty good. I'll now send it to the timeline copy and paste it, and there you have it, the first stage of our hit. Time for the melody, and this is where the keyboard comes in. Now, you've got a whole bunch of sounds at your disposal, I mean thousands of them, so if you don't like that, it's kind of Gary Newman, but not quite what I'm looking for, you just, with a flick of the wrist, change to another one. Sort of more what I'm after. I, I like that. It's got that kind of 80s analogue sound that I'm going for. OK, so let's say I'm going to use that particular synth sound. I now need to get whatever I play on the keyboard 
into the timeline so that it will play automatically. And it's nothing more complicated than hitting a record button. But here's a little tip. At the moment, my beat is recorded at 125 beats per minute. If I turn that down, it doesn't really matter, but I'll put it at 90 beats per minute, it's much easier to play the keyboard because it's slower. I'll demonstrate. Hang on. There you go. That's, that sounds all right. Right. Let's say that that is the melody I'm going for. I simply start at the beginning, press record, and play it into the timeline. Should have recorded if I play it back. There you go. I'll just put it back to the original tempo. That's not half bad. I'd dance to that. What our song needs now is some singing. Unfortunately, the Gadget Show team are not exactly the four tops. Take it up, take it up, take it up. Take it up higher. Yeah! Take it up. Take it up. Take it up. Take it up, go higher. Take it up, take it up. Higher. Take it up, take it up. Luckily, the software lets you get round the dearth of talent. There's a range of distorting filters and reverb effects that hide a multitude of sins. Take it up, take it up, take it up, take it up, go higher. Take it up, take it up, take it up, go higher. Well, I've only used what you see here. I've been working on this track for a total of about 24 hours. And finally, I think it's finished. I hope you like it. The beauty is you can just play around like it's a computer game, building up the layers of music to create a really complex track. A system like ours will cost about 350 quid. And remember, musical talent is not required. Can I take you? Now, it would be easy for our story to stop there, but we want to see just how far we can push this bedroom technology. So, join us in a moment to see how you can turn this into a number one. Here on The Gadget Show, we're big fans of digital photography. You can instantly see what you've taken. And as long as you've got a computer and a printer at home, you can make your own prints without going anywhere near a traditional darkroom. But what's great for printing small numbers of your finest work isn't so good at coping with large numbers of photos, like your holiday snaps. You don't want to spend ages tweaking every shot. And even though modern printers like this Canon are getting much faster, it's still rather irksome monitoring them as they churn out dozens of photos of that couple you met on the beach, who seemed oh so pleasant at the time. Plus, in my experience, they cost 40p per tiny print to run. So, what's the 21st century equivalent of taking your film to the chemists? To find out, we took a selection of our own holiday snaps on a short city break in Birmingham. We saw all the sights, the canals, Spaghetti Junction, the Rotunda and the rather radical new Selfridges. Then we set about getting them printed, snap-sized. Our first stop was, in fact, the chemists and one of the biggest names in photography, Kodak. They have these convenient-looking machines in boots and other places. Handily, I can take the card straight out of the camera and put it into the machine. Then it's just a matter of negotiating a few disclaimers, copyright notices and menus, and the pictures come up and I can start selecting the ones I want to print. I think I'll go for about 15. Have that one. Tick. I think I'll have that one. That one. 
we're getting there. And that one, nice one of Spaghetti Junction there. And there's the famous lady in the fountain. I'm not quite sure I want the, I want the top of her head in the picture, but what I can do is zoom in a bit and move the frame about to crop it. I can even add titles. They only take a few minutes to print out, and the quality is really quite impressive. But each print costs 49p. Ouch, that's too expensive for me, as is their overnight service, which is 35p a print for this number of shots. Much more sensibly priced are the terminals in Click and Max Spielman shops. In goes the card, choose the prints, and they'll print them out for you in about 20 minutes for 10p a shot on standard photo paper. The quality's decent, about what you'd expect from a high street photo printer. But there is a problem. Like the Kodak machines, they use 4 by 6 inch paper. That's the perfect proportions for 35 millimeter film. Most digital cameras, however, shoot a taller picture. So we've lost the top and bottom of the shot. And on these 10p machines, you don't get the chance to crop and zoom and choose which bit of the picture you want. And we've been forced to lose the top of the head of the lady in the fountain, which is really annoying. And surprisingly, you get the same problem with the self-contained photo printer we tried, the heavily promoted 150-pound Epson PictureMate. You can either insert the camera's card directly or hook the printer up to the camera with a cable. In both cases, no computer is required. Here, you select the pictures you want on the camera and leave the printer to get on with it. It takes about two minutes a picture and the printer automatically adjusts levels of contrast and colour. It costs around 29p a print. And if you don't have a computer or you don't want to use one to print out your digital photos, it's a very neat method to use. But it was also the method with the most cut-off. This is our lady in the fountain as we wanted to see her. This is how she emerged from the 10p click machine with the top of her head missing. And this is how she emerged from the Epson PictureMate with more off her top and bottom and a bit off the sides as well. So it would seem that however good your photographic skills, digital cameras mean either compromised, time-consuming or expensive prints. But just when we thought all hope was lost, we remembered the internet. Fortunately, there's a vast range of online printing services available, and I think they might just be the answer. Once you've downloaded the pictures from your camera onto your computer, you then upload them onto their servers and order your prints. We tried several, but this one, Photobox, proved to be the best. They have a vast range of paper sizes to exactly match the proportions of your prints. You can zoom in, you can crop, you can order them with borders or without. They'll even print out panoramic shots. And the cost of a basic print is just 19p. We got ours back within 24 hours, and the quality is very good. Not quite as good as on the home printer, but very, very acceptable. So, what's my advice? Well, I think you should stick with your main printer when you want to get a bit artistic with your prints, or when you need some snaps instantly. But when you can afford to wait a day or two for your everyday shots, I think you should use a good online service like Photobox. Either way, you don't need to visit the chemist ever again. Unless you're ill, obviously. Using equipment bought in a high street shop, we've made a three minute pop single called Take It Higher. For this music to be heard by the masses, traditionally you'd have to sweet talk record shops into stocking it, and then go to the colossal expense of getting loads of CDs manufactured. Then you'd have to convince a distributor to deliver your CDs all over the country. It's a very costly business, and one solution is to get a record company to do it all for you. Except record deals are rarer than hen's teeth. As ever, the internet is on hand, publishing online is cheap, and cuts out all the middlemen. You can easily put the tune on a free download website. However, even if a billion people downloaded your tune, it wouldn't enter the charts. Because for a song to count, it has to be sold for hard-earned cash.
There are just 21 music websites that feed into the official download chart, and we've chosen one with a reputation for promoting unsigned artists alongside big-name bands. They're quick, too. The Band-Aid single was recorded on a Sunday and ready to download by Wednesday. For about £750, they'll build you a mini website and offer your single for sale forever. They handle all transactions and offer the facility to buy via mobile phone. Then they'll inform the charts about how many singles have been sold in a week to determine your chart position. OK, let's talk numbers. Downloading music has increased 2,000% in the last year. Data is collected on some 58,000 artists. But the download chart is still relatively in its infancy, which means that to get your track into the download chart top 40, you need just 350 sales in a week. With 1,000 sales, you might be lucky enough to get into the top 10. And with just 3,500 sales, you could be looking at the much coveted number one. Now, obviously, we have the unfair advantage of being able to promote our single on a national television programme. But we're going to put that advantage to good use. All profits from our single will go to the Tsunami Relief Fund. So, even if you don't like the song, it's got to be worth shelling out 99p for a good cause. The single is on sale as of now, and this week's chart will be totted up Sunday morning. There's a link to the single on the Gadget Show website. So, get to it. the front door with something you'll never lose, your palm. No more fumbling for keys. Yep. The gold is then deposited onto the spoon. Oh, it's turning gold! Wow! <sighs> it's alchemy. <laughs> <laughs>